Hello, everyone. Fellow students, Dr. Scott, random strangers on YouTube who may be watching this for some unknowable reason, welcome to my presentation. My name is Allison Wadi, and I'm going to be talking about gender and the body in Ursula K. Le Guin's The Left Hand of Darkness. My thesis is The Left Hand of Darkness by Ursula K. Le Guin issues traditional societal ideas about gender and the body by portraying characters that defy cultural expectations of how the physical features of bodies are tied to gender identity. Um, starting off with a little bit about Ursula K. A. Lee Gwynn. She was born in 1929 and died just this year in 2018. Uh, she mainly wrote science fiction and fantasy, but she didn't like being labeled as a science fiction writer. She felt that it was limiting and that people took her writing less seriously because it was grouped into this category. Uh, a lot of her works were seen as subversive because of how they handled issues about gender and race. She was known for not revealing the gender or the race of her main character until halfway through a lot of her novels, which would cause the reader to have to question the way that they'd been viewing this character the entire time. The Left Hand of Darkness was considered one of her most subversive works, especially when it first was published in 1969. It won the Hugo Award for Best Novel in 1970, as well as the Nebula Award for Best Novel, and it was printed more than 30 times. Here are a few of the covers, starting on the left with the original one, and all the way on the right with the most current one. So a little bit of background information about this novel. This is the fourth novel in Le Guin's The Hainish Cycle, which takes place on, in an alternative universe slash a future universe uh, in which there are many different planets with human life, including our planet Earth. Um, on many of these planets, people have evolved in different ways. Some of them have special abilities, like the ability to dream while they're awake, or they have different physical features. Uh, Left Hand of Darkness takes place on a planet called Gethin, or they call it winter because it's always cold and covered in ice and snow. The people on this planet are all androgynous. They have no fixed sex, and once a month they can choose to take on either male or female sexual characteristics in order to mate. Any person on this planet can become pregnant, and they can also provide genetic material to impregnate somebody else. All right, so a brief plot summary. So the story follows the character of Genli Ai, a man from Terra, or Earth. He's sent to this planet to convince the people of the planet to join a coalition of humanoid planets called Ecumen. He tries and fails to convince the king of one of the two main countries on the planet, Carhide, to join this coalition, and he's helped by the Prime Minister, Estrovan, who tries to convince the king that this plan has merit, but ultimately they are unable to convince him of it. So he travels to the other major country, Orgata, and tries there as well to convince the government of that country to join this coalition. There he is captured and imprisoned, but ultimately he escapes with Estrovan's help. After a long journey, they return to Carhide, and their return triggers the collapse of both the Carhide and Orgata governments. This collapse ultimately leads to both governments agreeing to join the Ecumen Coalition. So ultimately he is able to achieve his goal of getting them to join, but it is only after a very long, arduous journey that he's able to. So gender on planet winter. The majority of people on winter are completely androgynous with no defined gender and no sexual characteristics, no physical sex characteristics in their bodies. Once a month during their mating cycle, they can take on sexual characteristics and they can choose whether they want to take on what our society would define as masculine or feminine characteristics, depending on their personal preference or how they want to be able to match up with their desired partner. Three or four percent of their population, however, does have static binary sexual characteristics. 
similar to what most people in our society have. The following quote from the text explains this. Excessive prolongation of the Kemar mating period with permanent hormonal imbalance toward the male or the female causes what they call perversion. It is not rare. Three or four percent of adults may be physiological perverts or abnormals. Normals by our standard. They are not excluded from society, but they are tolerated with some disdain, as homosexuals are in many bisexual societies. This is a direct critique on the way that gender and deviance from the gender norm are viewed in our society. Instead of a society where those whose bodies don't fit inside the constraints of the gender binary are considered other, Le Guin shows us a society where the opposite is true. Where having a body with static sexual characteristics and a gender identity that matches those characteristics is considered other. It's actually enough to relegate someone to the outskirts of society, the same way that people who don't fit into the gender binary of our society may be relegated to the outskirts of society. So, Jen Li Ai navigates gender. Um, in her article, The Interpretive Journey in Ursula K. Le Guin's The Left Hand of Darkness, Christine Cornell states, It is necessary to begin with the male narrator. Jen Li, he himself, is a reader a reader of cultures and of people, and as he is also the central narrator of Left Hand of Darkness, his readings are essential to our own. And this is exactly what we see as we watch him attempt to navigate this society, especially in terms of how he copes with a society where the constraints of binary gender, gender are basically non-existent. We are seeing the way that he deals with this, and it's the lens of how someone, a general person from our societal standpoint, would handle this. So as the political drama plays out in this novel, the reader gets to see Jen Li Ai's struggle to cope with the androgynous nature and fluid sexuality of the people on this planet. This is mainly shown through his evolving relationship with the character Estraven. He assigns gendered pronouns to the people of this planet and to Estraven. He mainly uses he, him pronouns for everyone. And this seems like just a way for him to be able to better navigate this society, to use terms that he understands, to be able to talk about them, describe them as people. Uh, his struggle to understand this type of non-binary gender system could be seen as a critique of the importance placed on physical markers of gender as we navigate through social situations. He also ends up ascribing gender to non-physical characteristics. And here is a quote from the text about that. I thought at the table Estrovin's performance had been womanly, all charm and tact and lack of substance, specious and adroit. Was it in fact perhaps this soft, supple femininity that I disliked and distrusted in him? For it was impossible to think of him as a woman, that dark, ironic, powerful presence near me in the firelit darkness. And yet whenever I thought of him as a man, I felt a sense of falseness, of imposture, in him or in my own attitude towards him. In the article Postcolonialisms, Genders, Sexualities, and the Legacy of the Left's Hand of Darkness, Wendy Pearson talks about this. She says, all the things Jen Lee dislikes about the Gathenians are precisely those qualities historically and contemporarily ascribed to women. In emphasizing characteristics associated with the female, the author calls into question all the naturalized assumptions about what it means to be human and less than human. But why does he ascribe feminine and masculine gender, gender to these things? In the article Towards an Other Dimension, an essay on transcendence of gender and sexuality, the authors state, how can you say you are mingling the masculine and the feminine unless you are sure you know what it is to be feminine and masculine? So why is he ascribing gender to concepts like tact, charm, and lack of substance? These things are not gendered and his attempts to gender them are all part of his attempt uh, being able to give binary identifications to the people of this planet, to label parts of them as male and female, because this is the only way he can understand them, even though these labels are not relevant to them and not applicable to them. Abstract concepts like charm and tact are not inherently feminine. Lack of substance certainly is not. 
and having a powerful presence isn't inherently masculine. Throughout this novel, Le Guin challenges the reader to question their perceptions of gender, particularly the ways that gender intersect with physical bodies. A great example of this is the character that Genli refers to as the King of Carhide. Genli I describes the sovereign leader of Carhide as the king, though this person is androgynous and has no gender. And because of the unique bi biology of these people, the king is actually able to become pregnant with his own heir. John Pennington talks about this in his article, Exercising Gender, Resisting Readers in Ursula K. Le Guin's Left Hand of Darkness. When Le Guin writes that the king was pregnant, she evokes a chuckle from the reader, but the phrase is a central metaphor for the reading strategy the reader is asked to perform. In other words, the novel forces readers to become androgynous readers. Readers are asked to resist reading from an any gendered perspective. The result of such a request is to keep the reader continuously off guard and unsettled, mirroring Gen Li Ai's predicament in the novel as he is forced to confront gender with his own limited perspective. Pregnancy is something that is deeply associated with female bodies, and finding out that a character that was given a masculine title throughout the novel is pregnant really challenges this idea. The reader is forced to separate the idea of a pregnant body from the idea of a female body. And this goes beyond just the physical process of pregnancy and birth. The reader has to separate the ideas of nurturing a child, both in utero and after birth, from the idea of a female body. As Kathy Rudy states in her article, Ethics, Reproduction, Utopia, Gender, and Childbearing in Women on the Edge of Time and the Left Hand of Darkness, anyone can inseminate, anyone can become pregnant. Every person is physiologically equipped for both roles. In this narrative, then, the intimacies and rewards of pregnancy and live birth are maintained but are available to everyone. Because of this, the intimate act of growing and nurturing a child is no longer something that only belongs to people with female bodies. So this seems to be kind of the turning point for Genli Ai. Around this part of the novel, he begins to really understand the concept that these people's gender is not tied to their physical bodies in the way that he has always understood gender to be. It's possible that the idea of the pregnant king helped him to reach this point of understanding. The following quote from the text really explains this well. When you meet a Gathenian, you cannot and must not do what a bisexual naturally does, which is to cast him in the role of man or woman, while adopting a corresponding role depending on your expectations of the patterned or possible interactions between persons of the same or the opposite sex. Our entire pattern of sociosexual interaction is non-existent here. They cannot play the game. They do not see one another as men or women. This is almost impossible for our imagination to accept. What is the first question we ask about a newborn baby? As well as acknowledging that sex and gender are not correlated the same way they are in his society, Genli also acknowledges how difficult this is to imagine for someone used to binary gender. This makes it difficult for him to understand these people in general and to be able to form a friendship with Estrovin. By the end, however, he makes strides toward both of these goals. We see this clearly in this final quote. I drew the double curve within the circle and blacked the yin half of the symbol, then pushed it back to my companion. Do you know this sign? He looked at it a long time with a strange look, but he said, no. It's found on Earth, and on Haim Devenant, and on Chifwar. It is yin and yang. Light is the left hand of darkness. How did it go? Light, dark, fear, courage, cold, warmth, female, male. It is yourself, both in one, a shadow on snow. When Gen Li Ai says this titular line, this is him coming to terms with the nature of Estrovin's gender. With the genders of the people on this planet, and Li Guin really invites the reader to do the same. The yin-yang symbol is useful for this. It helps him understand the duality of everything. Characteristics that he would describe as both masculine and feminine exist within Estrovin's body, the bodies of the people on winter, and really within his own body as well, both in one. He isn't immune to this. 
nor is the reader. Gender is a balance, and Lee Gwynn does a great job of bringing Jen Lee, and through his eyes, the reader, to this conclusion. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Fellow classmates, Dr. Scott, random strangers on YouTube who stayed till the end for some unknowable reason, I appreciate your time.